This is episode number one of the My Niche is Human podcast. Hello, guys and gals. Thank you for making it to episode one. This is an interview format with my good friend, Dean Kalora. He is a Tampa native that I met back in school and has been running multiple businesses since of recent. He is the CEO and founder of TitleTap, a marketing platform for real estate title companies. But here's why you should care, if you care, to continue listening. I dive in with Dean about some of his background, but the high points that he touches on is one, his emotional challenges with finding and nurturing a co-founder. You know, there are plenty of blog articles and books written about that. For those of you who are in this challenge or seeking one, he gives you a really good background on how he found it, found his co-founder, worked through that process, and continued to nurture that relationship. The second high point is he talks about the challenges of raising a family well, all while continuing to crush it. He has a special little place in my heart as far as men that I respect. He's been raising a family ever since I've known him. So as I think back on the challenges that I have faced since I started my entrepreneurial journey, I think about guys like Dean or women who are also raising families. I bow my hat to you. So with that said, let's get into the episode. No one in business cares about your master's degree. The single biggest, for me anyway, return on investment of my master's education, without doubt, was meeting my partner, meeting the co-founder of the company we've got. So that by itself made it worth it. That's not everyone's experience, but more and more you find that the relationships behind the traditional college experience are what people remember most or have the most value tied to. At least for business people, if you're going to go in for precursors for like a being an attorney or a CPA or something like that, that's, that's just committed, awesome. But for the rest of us, it's, you do kind of fumble your way out of a degree going, okay, now what? You know, now what do I do? I got to still go sell myself and mm-hmm. you know, try to prove to somebody else I've got value. Right. Kind of a topic I didn't expect, but co-founders. Mm. That's a big thing for people in entrepreneurship. Should I do it? Should I not? Yep. Disaster stories, success stories. Yeah. Was there kind of even maybe a subconscious vetting process that you went through when you met him? Yeah. And I will say that was probably one of the benefits of the program is, as you're aware, we, we had to work in a lot of small group projects with deadlines. Everyone kind of had to carry their own weight. And I think you get to learn a lot about people in that process, right? So everyone's busy. Everyone's got real jobs and some of us have families. And so you really kind of get an insider view of how someone's work ethic really plays out. And so he and I just connected there. Uh, It was just an understanding, which was nice because you're never having to look over your shoulder. Is is he going to really do what he says says he's going to do? And that's huge. So that kind of laid a really nice foundation. We had some other commonalities where we were in life. You know, we were both married for several years, both just having kind of our first kids. And so we're in trying to figure out the balance with family and work and and trying to sort through it. I think that's really important when we talk about co-founders is because it is a marriage, right? And so when you're not aligned in life, in just where you are in life, it can be difficult. If one of us was, let's say, just single, went out, partied every night. And, Going through a divorce. or That really grinds people it up. It grinds people, yeah. yeah. So, And I mean, and not to take away anyone's life events, but it's really, really important when time is such a scarcity at that level that you are in sync there because then you have to sort through the, the rest of the stuff to actually make any progress on what you're trying to work on. Whereas if you're aligned there, it's like, okay, you just turn on and you can execute. And that's proven, I mean, time and time. Entrepreneurship's lonely, man. It is a very lonely road and it is scary. It's fun. It's daunting in senses that you are exploring an avenue that is unchartered in many ways. It means something different for everybody. Long-winded question, but I am a firm believer in the right co-founder. Not, yeah, you should go out and get one. It needs to be the right one that aligns with where you are in life personally, because it will have a direct impact on how you execute professionally. Cool. So to like kind of recap all that. Yeah. Thanks for the explanation. Sure. You're saying if we were to kind of make a list. Yep. Make sure you're aligned. And what else would you add to that? Yeah, align. So, so take a look at all the layers. Take a look at where you stand personally. How do you manage your time personally? 
and then literally sync up your calendars and say, oh, you're involved in all this stuff or time zones. I mean, the remote thing works. Again, it's all about time blocking. So what I would recommend is that if you're exploring a co-founder relationship or a partnership, really take your time with it. Size up each other's calendars, see how you manage time. That's the, the number one thing. Number two, where are your interests? Because what ends up happening is you spend a lot of time with this person. So if you have completely opposite interests, at some point, there's a drift that happens, right? After the honeymoon phase is over and you guys are like... Just like any crushed, relationship. Just like any relationship. You literally got to treat it like a, like a marriage. And our wives joke about that with us all the time. But it's very, very true. So, and trust. Again, foundations of any relationship. I mean, you're going to be sharing bank accounts. You're going to be sharing tax stuff, communication. <laughs> I see the sweat, you know, bubbling up, Steve. I don't know what that's about, man. But like I said, it can be very, very scary stuff. But that's real. I mean, that is absolutely real. If you can't trust this person with the money in the bank, probably a good sign to take it slower or that's not the right fit. Mm -hmm. So it's maybe so, a lot of gut checks at the beginning. Lot, dude, lay it out, lay it out. And do not be afraid to put the nature of the relationship in writing. Mm -hmm. Everyone does a handshake, which is cool until stuff goes wrong. And then you're scrambling and having to hire attorneys and have just scrub out that nonsense while you guys are up front with what you want to do, put it down in writing, have an agreement, know what happens when, not if, but when stuff goes wrong, because it's going to go wrong and have it all sorted in the beginning. So that way it's clear cut. There's no confusion. I can't like implore too much that the, the severity of that, of not doing that. The opportunity cost is, is huge. So sort it up front. Think of every good intention you might have, multiply that by 10 on what bad intention could be and iron those out early because right there will be a qualification of whether that partnership is going to work or not. So I wonder, are you speaking from experience? Have you had done this oh, in yeah. the past? So can Absolutely. you speak to that? With, obviously yeah, that yeah, name yeah name? sure. You know, I think at a young age, I've always been one to sort of try to figure out how to make the world a better place. Naturally, trying to not do that by myself because there's people way smarter than me. You know, I just wanted to be part of the journey. So in that, you tend to put a lot of faith in, hey, everything's going to work out. I'm going to go, I'm going to meet up with this person. They're either well connected in this sphere or they're very knowledgeable in that. Never really asking what they want out of it or what is their end game? What is the, what is the exit? What is the output? Because I'm just excited just to be started, you know? So a lot of the, I just want to do it, I just I want to do, do it, man. I just want to do it, right? A lot of the formalities go out. And so, and I've had it where, look, we had, I had one instance where in a prior partnership in my early days where partner was was skimming off the off the company account to pay just for personal bills so had he come to me and be like hey i'm struggling man i need some help this month or next month i would have been like cool do whatever we got to do you know we I'll, lean this way till we get back to seven yeah, and then we uh, even whatever out. yeah do we need to do a garage sale wash car whatever it takes you know we, we, i don't you know but be transparent mm -hmm. instead he just took and so i had to find out when we were reconciling bank statements that well, that charge isn't familiar. What's that about? And as I dug deeper, I could see what was happening and it just made it awkward, right? At that point, trust was kind of pierced and it's really difficult to build that back, especially when you're moving so fast. Mm -hmm. So things didn't naturally didn't work out. Mm -hmm. I would just highly encourage you to, but that's the other thing too, is, is to be transparent. You're going to have downtimes. You're going to have, you're going to get hit in the gut with something. It's just a matter of, of the seasons we go through in life. Just be real about it. People get it, you know what I mean? And I think when you're honest about what's going on, you'd be surprised how much they want to help. And it's not so much a judgment thing. It's not so much, hey, I'm going to, that's it, we're done. No, I mean, if you're, your intentions are true and you're out there to do some good, people are going to rally and, and help you any way they can. But you got to communicate that. you got to be transparent. And if I may jump Go in, that's on the flip side as well. So if you're mm. in a partnership and you have something going on, and you are transparent with them, and they can't handle that, they can't support you, they're not willing to help you, then maybe you're in the wrong partnership as well, you right? So it goes both ways. Qualifications, man. And that's why all of what we're talking about now, I know it's a lot of kind of back and forth, but the end game is qualify. 
take your time to qualify a person. Listen, there's in any co-founder relationship, man, you've got legal implications. You've got tax implications. You've got, as you grow, your reputation is going to now lay in the arms of somebody else. And starting out, it may not seem like a big deal, but after 300 customers, 500 customers, 1,000 customers, now you're being asked to speak at different places. Now, and you have to think ahead. Where is this going to go? And is this someone who can scale up with me? And that may not always be clear up front. So one of the things we practice a lot, uh, Elliot and I, my co-founder, is every quarter, every year, I mean, we just, we true up. It's like, hey, what do you, are we still in line with what we're trying to accomplish? And that's both personally and professionally because that's so, so important. And we've kind of had that practice for the past decade plus. That's awesome. Yep. So for anyone who's listening, they might be thinking, yeah, that's great. But then what? What, what if you don't exactly line up? What are your contingencies? Have, are, were those built in from the beginning? Are you developing those as you go? Yeah, so, so at any time, if there ever is a gap, and as long as you're, I think, being disciplined about that practice, there's no train coming. You kind of see what's developing along the way and sort of pivot at that point. And those tend to change as time goes on and your interests grow or different life events happen. I mean, there's a lot of unforeseen circumstances that just happen. So I think trying to identify the major ones that you know could possibly happen, figuring out an exit to do that, a good operating agreement will, will help kind of navigate those waters. But just being frequent in the discussion, it's kind of like death. No one really wants to talk about dying. Not a lot of people plan for it either. Not a lot of people plan for all it. that stuff. I mean, it's you got it, man. Big and issue. Until it's the end. Mm -hmm. And so and it's sad because it puts everybody in a really weird position that are impacted by that event. So there are knowns that you know could, could possibly happen. So I would say do yourselves justice by just sitting down and like baking those out. You know what I mean? Just having, a, uh, hey, we're going to take a right turn if this happens. We're going to take a left turn if that happens. We've taken our time with, with doing some of that and then just try to stay kind of frequent with you know, touch points on, hey, so things still going good, you're still enjoying what you're doing, any new goals, you know, and just try to align that way. So perfect. You said new goals. I was wondering, you know, we all have side interests, side hustle, mm -hmm. passion project, whatever. Do those come up? And do you feel like if one person in the co-foundership has a side interest, do they feel like, not like you're cheating on me, but you're like kind of pulling bandwidth away from our missions? And, and does that come up? How is that dealt with? Yeah. So great question. Naturally, I find many people who have an entrepreneurial spirit suffer from that, the shiny object syndrome. You know, it's, it's like, man, bunch of squirrels. there's a bunch of squirrels, right? And it's very natural. It's in your DNA. You're designed to do that. What ends up happening, though, is as you sink your teeth into a project that actually is experiencing some success, you tend to, I think, figure out that your time is extremely limited. And if you've got something that's working, you need to double down. Right. And so it's OK to have three or four. I was one of those guys. Right. I had three or four things going on. You know that, Steve. You know, I, was, I had my hand. And you're like, man, it's a, it's a lot of. And what I figured out is that once we had some headwind in what was, what was happening with this particular company, it demands your focus. It's not even like an option. It demands it if it's going to be successful. So you do have to start peeling back some of those. Now, it doesn't mean you can't have a passion project. Absolutely. But I think time blocking, you know, we talk about this a lot in your calendar and being, again, transparent as to when you're going to dedicate time for that passion project. I find as long as you communicate, over communicate, right? That's a huge thing. I tell that to, you know, a lot of our team, over communicate. Don't assume people just know because they don't. <laughs> so put it Nothing on the calendar. Nothing goes without saying. Nothing goes without saying. You, yeah. you definitely have to make folks aware Following your passion is really important, especially when it's in a non-business context. Giving back to the world in something other than money. Is that like, altruism? Like time. Is that the word? I guess you could. Altruistic. Call it. It's, yeah, you're, okay. you're getting sophisticated on me. Sorry. <laughs> but that's important, right? Le leaving a bit of that legacy. If you've learned something really cool, the odds that someone else is struggling with that and could benefit from that value is, is real. Like that, that is real. So it's your duty to kind of pass that on as a human being. So follow it. Both uh, Elliot has things that he's involved with. I, I've got stuff that I'm involved with. But true to center, what allows you Love the that. ability to do those things mm -hmm. is 
part of what you're doing as a, a partnership in whatever you're, you're blossoming with, with whatever it is, whatever company it is, right? Because it's, it gives you that ability, that blessing of time. Honor the source. Honor the know, source, yeah. right. right. So Absolutely. you can balance it. I would say you'd have to take a look at your, your bandwidth, be honest about it. Don't overcommit. I think a lot of people struggle with no. They struggle with mm. the word no. Mm-hmm. It's taken me a long time to figure that out because you, you, you want to be one that is a team player, but it actually backfires, you know, because now you do nothing really well and you become kind of, you know, you're, you're, you're doing everything kind of half pace and that's, no one benefits from that. There's no nobility in having a hundred projects. Correct. We've all heard that. Correct. Right. And so focus, focus, it would be, and you hear this a lot now, especially in the entrepreneurial community. It is, it is by far one of the most important disciplines that you can apply to yourself, whatever it is, just be really committed to it. And it's hard, man, right? Because I mean, if, especially if you're just starting out in the game and you're trying to make a living, trying to support a family, if you've got one, trying to lift off a new company, that's very, very difficult to do. And so be patient with yourself. We hear a lot about patience. It's, it's real, man. It, it may not happen tomorrow, but it will happen if you just commit to the process and feed into it. And I can kind of get into that a little bit later, just depending on what you want to talk about. Sure. But you're talking about focus. Focus. And a lot of my mission here really is to take these high-level concepts and really cut those in half. So when we talk about focus, yeah. what does that mean to you? And when I say that, at some point, I mean, gradually over time, you had to tailor your focus. And your focus was based on interest, follow your heart, pay the bills. How did you kind of chisel away at that to eventually get to your why? And that's ultimately what I'm asking here. What's your why and how did focus get you there? Yep. So great question. And early on, it's something that I had to define to understand. We talked about output. Where are you going? Like, what is the end game, right? That comes in phases based on your progress in your journey. My initial output goal was to get out from under a nine to five job that put pressures I couldn't, con- not that you can control every pressure, but, but put constraints on my, my use of time in ways that really debilitated my creativity and really sucked the life out of my ability to pour into my family. Right. That, and so it, and that'll eat away at you. Oh, it eats away. It yeah. eats away at you every day because for those of that, out in your audience that have a family, even as a kid, we're all kids growing up, it's a finite time. It's a finite era in life, in a life cycle, and you don't get that back. So creating more opportunity for you to have time to connect in ways that you want to connect without having a thumb on you saying, oh, you can't do it here, you can't do it there, was my driver. So those were the two things that I really was just laser focused on. And my, my co-founder was aligned in the same way, had the same desire. So those one to two focused outputs were what we were trying to work towards. So was that the ability for creative expression and then time family to get back to my family? Correct. Awesome. Correct. And creative expression a lo- uh, kind of having to do with time, right? Being able to come up with how I wanted to use my time. Right. That is when we talk about creative expression, that's what that meant for me then and still is very true to me today. So that was the goal. Right. So so kind of navigating that we we hit that marker when the business was able to now. And mind you, Elliot and I did not have any funding. We built this business on zero investment dollars. I'm not saying that's right. I'm not saying that's wrong. That's how we did it. Bootstrapping. Straight bootstrapping, dude, and I'm, I'm a firm believer. You know, it's because yeah. again, what we didn't want to do, and I'm not knocking any investors out there, sure. but we didn't we didn't want to buy a boss. That for us, like oh, we just we just were leaving that mm-hmm. corporate arena, and we're like, we've learned so much on what not to do. <laughs> we didn't want to get right back into that arena, and for us, it worked, right? I mean, it was very calculated. It happened over a span of eight years, eight years, not. Six months, not a year, not two years, eight years, you know, to kind of grow into and grow up a company that could support our families and allow us to now leap over full time patience. That was hard because there was many, 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 many nights. And we both have wonderful spouses that were understanding of that. It's a whole nother conversation. That's um, a whole nother episode. Yeah, yeah. But it was um, a lot of what are you guys doing again? It's not 
you're not making any money, so why are you spending all this? You know, and, and it was just an investment that we made early on to try to get to that end game. So that focus was key. That output was where we were trying to head to. So we, we hit that goal. And then those milestones started to kind of shift now because now we, we earned the right to creatively express how we want to use our time. So then the goal started to be, hey, well, what do we want to do now? <laughs> it, it, it's amazing how it's, there's no way it's possibly linear because when you get started, your lens is only so wide from the position you're in. But like you're saying, as you free up bandwidth, you start thinking differently and you're all, it's not a straight line anymore. Spot on, man. Yeah. 100%. It's amazing. 100%. And, and that's why the game of patience is so hard because you, you think you see what you see, but the world does change when you don't have these constraints on you that, and I'm not saying that I encourage people to work a nine to five as long as it takes for you to see your dream come out. Just know it's, it's, it's hustle, right? I mean, it's a lot of one, two o'clock all nighters. That's just what it is. We did that for seven or eight years and, and that's okay. Like that's part of it. That's part of what you get to talk about later, you know, that, Hey, it's, it was true. Like it, it didn't just happen overnight. So there's a hint yeah. at the overnight success, which is another interesting sure. piece of that. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll touch on that later. But it was funny. I, we didn't know, Steve, where things were going to go. We just followed what felt right. And we knew that the contribution we wanted to leave, not only for our families, but to kind of help other people also that we connected with in the process to help them also understand there's another way to, to do this thing. You know, you don't have to go the route of, of hanging your, your shingle corporately with somebody else and always kind of fitting in the box. And so it doesn't work in every scenario. It worked for us and it worked for a lot of the folks that we brought on to see like, wow, I can actually balance a personal passion in life with making you know enough money to support my family, you know, as well. So cool. So when you talked about the the business eight years ago, mm-hmm. you know, late nights at the at the kitchen table kind of thing, is it the same business now as it was then? Have you gone through iterations? And tell me about if it was iterations. I'm kind of jumping ahead. How did you identify when the right time was to pivot? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So all this, just to back up a step, all, all of what I just des- described, we talked about output. We talked about what's the next step, not necessarily 10 steps down the road, because it's going to, that part's going to, that 10th step is going to be different. When you get to step four, you're going to see step 10 differently. What is the next step? So one thing that I would strongly encourage is pick your, you know, and I think it's Gary Keller that has the the one thing. uh, Well, you kept saying do one thing. I'm like, do one thing well, the book, one thing. Yeah. The one thing. Yeah. 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 That, that is, I love that book and it truly applying that in every facet of your life It doesn't mean do one thing forever. It just means do one thing to get you to the next one thing. Move the needle. Move the needle. And so our one thing is, hey, we got to break free. We got to break free because that's going to allow us to do the next one thing. Yeah, to answer your question about iterations, defining success as you go does change. I think for for us, it was always about, I don't mind working hard. I want to work smart. And I don't want to work like... 80 hours a week, because that totally, d- d- that goes back to the antithesis of why I did this to begin with. It's completely backwards, and I, and I, and I don't want to do that. So for us, pivot and iteration happen when we start creeping into those longer nights and weekends and getting away from the family, and it's all work, 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 work. That's when we know it's like, hey, it's time to press pause. What are we doing here? Why are we doing it? And for us, it's, it has always been never about growing the fastest, right? It's, it's about growing smart and calculated and growing true to why you're doing what you're doing in the first place. So the iterations have come about because, you know, we're starting to feel like, hey, this is too much. You know, why? And maybe we needed to change a process or automate something or hire someone to, to do what we were doing. And so that's kind of how we gauged our iterations is really monitoring our time, monitoring what we're doing in that time and how much time we're spending. Mm -hmm. I was going to say and how you're doing it because you're speaking to what I get excited about is automation process. So I feel like when people first get started to sell in what you said earlier, I just want to do something. And I'm perfectly guilty of that. When I started my first business, I was like, I just want to do something. But I didn't think about 
the lifestyle that would surround and support the business model that I created. Sure. Yeah. So when you talk about iterations, it's like each step or each iteration kind of builds in lessons learned from the past. And that kind of develops your business model to make it scalable, make it automated, make limit your interactions, the bottlenecks, all that type of stuff. Yeah. But then there's also like an emotional piece to that as well. Yeah. There is. There is. I have always put you kind of in this little area, you know, when comparing people I met from grad school or other entrepreneurs that I know, because you've had a family the whole time I've known you. Mm -hmm. And here I am on my journey, ups, downs, whatever. But then I'm like, I can't imagine having kids. And then I look at guys like you, I'm like, how the fuck do you do it? <laughs> and, you know, I understand yeah. everything's relative and you sure. adjust, yeah. but um, I'm still curious. So I have a, I have a couple Let's questions go, go about it, that because our demographic right now, our age, there's certainly people listening who are in the hustle and they're fathers. So how has family slash raising a family in, impacted your life and how has that translated into your business? Good question. It's definitely punched me in the face a couple of times. By design, you want to move at pace and fast and you want to you want to get out and just crush it, right? That's yeah, the thing, that right? crush it. Yeah. Well, when your two, two-year-old is having a nightmare and you are working on a, on a presentation, she's going to get the priority and the presentation is just going to have to wait. Or if there is an event and true to form, I've missed my fair share of their events. That sucks. You know, that's not, not, that's not proud because, Steve, I, you know, I, it's taken me a while to navigate that. Again, there's no blueprint on how to balance being a business owner, entrepreneur, having a family, being a good dad, trying to be a good husband, there's no formula for that. But being punched in the face, knowing that I'm never going to get that opportunity again, like I, I missed it. That doesn't have to, have to happen a lot <laughs> for you to be like, you know, I, I got to do better. Mm. There, that meeting can wait. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing here that's going to collapse if I just spend an extra hour with, with and them. if it collapses, if I may sound woo-woo for a second, yeah. it wasn't yours. Yeah. Right? Well, I mean, you can just let it go. You let it go and, you know, you can always rebuild something. But a, a relationship like that at such impressionable ages is really, really difficult. And the trust, as we know, you know, you want to keep that strong with your, your nucleus. Because if your family life is off, forget about it. Everything else, why are you doing what you're doing? You know what I mean? And it's going to have an impact on your on your personal ability to connect with customers, to connect with your team. It'll be a cloud, and and so you you're going to have your ups and your downs. But it's very very important, I think, to try to plug in, be present, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that's the key. I still work on it to this day. I'm learning every day, and you're going to have your failures, man. But you you try to learn. The hardest part about all that is, I think, that the fact that you have people depending on you. So. Turn that on its side and use it as a drive. And so a lot of people, I get that question a bit, you know, like, hey, how do you do what you do with a family and kids and being, you know, everywhere? Know that you're not going to be everywhere. Know that you are going to have to make certain choices to try to apply a balance, but you're going to misstep sometimes, you know, but you just try to, you know, talk about iterations. You try to iterate, right, mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. and try to be a better self better dad, better husband. And it takes practice. It takes work like anything else. But I've really leaned on them to keep me real, if that makes sense. And they do a good job at that. <laughs> no know? problem calling dad out. No, no problem calling yeah. me out. And I used to get a little bit defensive about it. Like, well, I'm providing, I'm trying to do all That's not even the point. The point is emotionally, and if you think about kind of what people hang on to as they get older, it's those relationships. It's, you know, your accolades, all that stuff is great, but it's really, how did you connect with me? Mm -hmm. How did you really impact mm -hmm. what I do? That's what people remember. Mm -hmm. And so more importantly, when it's your own kids and, and your spouse, you mm -hmm. know, so you really want to keep those priorities high and be transparent with them as well. Like, hey, I can't make this event, but, you know, I'm going to be there for this one. You're not going to be able to make all of them, but try to be there as much as you can. You talked about how impressionable they are. Yeah. And you also mentioned you got a little defensive at times. You're like, but I'm providing. I mm -hmm. feel like I'm doing. So 
I always imagine what it's going to be like having conversations with my kids because they're so impressionable. You want to leave all the goodness with them. So how do you toe the line between setting the example of being the dad who's around and then being the dad who hustles? Because you kind of want to mm -hmm. show them both. Is there a fine line there? I think that's going to be defined differently for, for everybody in your audience. You certainly try to, I think, lead by example. But to be honest with you, man, especially depending on the age of the, of, of the kids, a lot of them just don't care. <laughs> they just want you here. They just want you. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, just, they just want to hang. They want to have a good time with you and laugh and be connected to you. Mm -hmm. And they don't know what you do for business. They don't know what you do for, for work. Those concepts don't, I think, start to gel until a little bit later on in their childhood. Mm -hmm. But I think to pass along some of the ethic is really making them work for things and earn things, you know, at a young age and having kind of that reward system set up so that they understand like it's not all entitlement. It's I have to actually earn something. And again, we talk about no and not always getting what they ask for because that's just life. But that comes in stages, mm -hmm. you know, that comes in stages as they grow. You know, you learn along the way, like everyone's going to have a little bit different experience. Everyone's kind of parameters of parenting is going to be slightly different to what's true to you. how does it gel you. with your spouse's style? Has That's to like gel, a, a, lot yeah. of, a lot of moving dynamics. There's a lot there. Yeah, there's a lot there. So again, over-communicate. Awesome. So speaking of, I mean, you're kind of touching on family dynamics. Yeah. How does that all work together? That leads into my next question. Sure. So as much as you want to speak to it, what were your family dynamics growing up? Mm. And how has that shaped your strengths, both emotionally and mentally? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. So, man, I was so so blessed to have the parents I've got, almost everything that foundationally was ingrained in me at a young age, I apply in some way today. And I think we're all sort of byproducts, you know, especially with parents. Now, you know, both my parents worked all the time, but also found time to kind of plug in when they could. And every era is a little bit different. We joke about this all the time. Generationally, you know, I think the goal of that generation is to do something, learn from the last one and, mm -hmm. and to do evolution, better. evolution of, mm -hmm. of the generation, right? But being able to, I think, learn how important it is to look someone in the eye, shake a hand, just fundamentals. Yes, sir. You no, know, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Being please. respectful. Please. Thank you. Manners. Yeah, they're huge. Not expecting anything, but being grateful when you do get something. Just some basic fundamentals that honestly... Even in our business, when you apply that, people connect with it, right? They connect with it. Everyone is so, and this is kind of sad, but look, go to any support for anything that you're having trouble with at home. You dial up support. It's over 60% where that experience is not a good one. It's just because of this lack of fundamentals of just really listening to what the customer is saying, empathizing, and, and trying to be a solution maker. So one of the biggest attributes I think they passed along to me and my brother was that if you're going to come to the table with a problem, come prepared with how you're going to solve it, don't just come to me with a problem. And so we were instilled that at a very young age. And so you leverage that mindset a lot, right? Because as long as you can solve problems, you're going to always be in demand. Mm -hmm. That applies across a lot of boards, but my folks, you know, I think it was very instrumental. My, my grandfather was an entrepreneur back in his days at, in Cuba. My, my, my grandfather brought a bunch of uh, huge uh, farming business and did a lot of work with uh, going back and forth with import-export in Miami with fruits and vegetables. And, you know, my, my mom learned a lot from him as a businessman. Naturally, she grew in her ranks in the executive world, taught a lot of stuff to us growing up. It was great. And uh, my dad, I mean he would give you the shirt off his back. He's just that guy. And yep. so, you know, humble pie, that's who he is. Mm -hmm. And so he's a doer. He would rather just do it, you know, doesn't talk about stuff and just takes action. So we had tremendous examples growing up and learned a lot. So with that said, you talked about your children now. Mm -hmm. You, know, you kind of joked, but I, I respect it. You know, they're, they're just too young. They don't care what daddy does. So for you, you were surrounded by all this entrepreneurial influence, mm -hmm. I'll say. Do you remember if there was an age when it kind of occurred to you like, oh, I want to do what daddy does or what mommy does or what grandpa does, you know? It's interesting, man. For me personally, I just knew and I, and I, and I find this true with a lot of entrepreneurs. It's just something in you that wants to leave an impact. 
you don't really have it predefined naturally. Like the, you know, I want to be a fireman. I want to be a policeman. I want to do what what our parent, you know, parents do. I think that's a natural thing to lean on, kind of growing up, because it's your examples. We talked about imitation, and I think parents. I mean, that's what it is. You're setting examples so your kids can imitate the good. Hopefully, not the bad, but the good, even though they imitate everything. And so, yeah, for. For us, it, it, you know, for me, it was just I knew I wanted to leave a positive impact on the planet. I didn't know how I was going to do that, but I knew it was in me to do it. And every time I got into a corporate environment, I just felt I felt constrained. And that's just not who I was. For some people, that's okay, you know, but for my makeup, I wanted more. I couldn't really do things the way I wanted to do them, how I wanted to do them. So, Yeah. I don't know if that answered the question. No, that's awesome. So that leads me into, I got to ask it's cliche as ever. I get a sense of your definition for entrepreneurship, but I want to ask you what that is to you. Because you almost kind of said it just now. Yeah. So it kind of goes back to creative expression of time, but it's deeper than that. It really is your opportunity to leave something positive behind. We talk about entrepreneurship as being something you do outbound. It could be entrepreneurship too, inside of a company. It doesn't have to be that. It's just, it's the creative opportunity to leave something positive behind that is of true value that makes the world a better place. That is, in summation, what I feel entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship is out there for the taking to help you do. Mm -hmm. And we have... We're very blessed to be in a time where you can do that, where, where you've got the ability to do it, you know. And so would highly encourage, if you've got that passion in you, mm-hmm. to follow it. Mm-hmm. Be calculated. Don't rack up a bunch of debt. Don't, it's okay to work while you build, mm-hmm. you know. That's, you know. So that's a perfect segue. You talk about these times and these tools and all these things that are available to us. But there's also these scripts and these stories of what it is to be an entrepreneur So my next question is, what to you is the biggest fallacy of the story of entrepreneurship and how can we help to address it slash save people wasting time and energy? People just coming up. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's being authentic. Don't fall under the predefined notion of success. And I think in entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurial ecosystem, there's a lot of that. Funding rounds, gross revenues, customer counts. Don't let anyone predefine what success is to you. The why is important, and that goes back to being authentic to yourself. I think if you're truly authentic to who you are as a person and what you're looking to get out of it, again, I go back to output, that's something worth rallying behind. And you will be successful because people recognize real. When I'm on the phone with a customer or when I'm on, on, talking to, to, to folks, be who you are. You're not going to get slapped on the wrist because you weren't being authentic. Now, I understand there's, you know, there's some extremes on either side, but really following your mission statement for yourself, I think if you do that, it doesn't matter if you get the funding or not. It doesn't matter if you have 100 customers by next year. It's good to have goals, but don't let that define who you are. I would say that's really, really an important step. So so the fallacy of you have to be at a certain X to be, quote unquote, a successful company. I think that's BS. Mm -hmm. You know, I think success could be, hey, you just bought yourself 25 more hours to spend with your family or to take that trip or to experience a summer off guess what? Humans are built on experience, on relationship, and having more opportunity to do those things, for some people, that's huge success. That's what it was for us and continues to be. That's awesome. So this leads me to kind of my wrap-up question. Shoot. All these things combined, if you were able to, and part of me believes you are, if you could, what are the top three things you would tell your 8, 18, and 28-year-old self? Let's see. Let's start with the eight-year-old. Yeah, so my eight-year-old self, I would say, eight's tough because that's a, that's, a, that's a sensitive age. I would, I would try to have myself, I think, 
I don't want to say play more outside because I was out there all the time. Mm -hmm. But even at eight, you know, I was thinking ahead a lot. It's weird. So I would try to just enjoy being eight. You know, we always want to be older when we're really, really young. I, I fell in that trap too. Even though it's kind of playful at eight, you're always like, well, I, I can't wait till I'm don't rush it. Fifth grade. Don't rush it. Just be eight. Go have fun. And, you know, don't, again, don't fall into what the mold or, or the environment's trying to push you into. Just just be eight. Mm-hmm. So I would say, yeah, I would, I would tell myself to be, be eight more. Okay. At 18, true to form, I, I was doing the same thing. Okay. <laughs> I was trying to be 30 at 18. Mm. I didn't take, I don't think I took the opportunity to really look at what was really important for me. So I, I, I went and followed the prescription of, hey, go to college, graduate, do the mentorship, get the suit, do the court. I would have probably taken a year off and not done the college thing, to be honest, and just worked, like worked at different gigs, traveled. I think I was so hung up on other people's perception of, A, not being a success or not knowing what I wanted to do in my life, is there an aspect of keeping up, too, with, like, everyone keeping else? Keeping up, yeah. Friends were getting jobs here and there or going to college or, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's it's keeping up with sort of that pace. I, I would have told myself, yo, just take a breath. Mm-hmm. It's okay to take a year, two years. Go learn. Especially at that age. Yeah, at that age. I mean, there's so much you just don't know. Mm-hmm. And so I think filling the cup with a little bit more true life experience would have helped me navigate college a little bit better. Yeah. And like you said, in iterations, it's not linear. So our lens is only so big from that perspective. If you took a year off, that widened you like crazy. Maybe you would have, you know, yeah. done different things. Yeah, absolutely. And what was the last age? 28. 28. So by 28, I was well into being married. I had 28. Yeah, we had our, our first already. 28 was, was an interesting age because that was right around the time where I had gone back to school. So I was kind of in that mode. And I think at 28, I thought I had it figured out. I thought I had everything mapped out. Life was good. I had a good job at the time. Was still fresh like four or five years into being married. Had a new baby. So a lot of new experiences there. I wouldn't have changed any of that part personally because... It was beautiful. You know, it helped me kind of mold. But going back professionally, thinking that you're safe. And so this was kind of like the trigger, right? So I fell back into, oh, things are good, right? I've got a good job. It's safety. Got insurance. I've got a family. Thinking I was safe. And then I was in a job where it was connected to real estate. And obviously when we had the recession, everything that touched real estate for the most part, imploded. And that was no different. So that forced my mindset back into what I kind of was the voice in me to, to always want to do something. You know, it made me, it stripped away all the... Knocked you on your ass and said... Punch me in the face. What are you going to do yeah. now? Yeah, what are you going to do? You yeah, might as you, well do something you want to do. You got to reinvent, right? You got nothing you, else to lose. You, you got to iterate. It. Exactly. Yeah. And, and think about that, right? I'm, I'm kind of early married, have a mouth, two mouths to feed, like the provider mindset is like in full bore. So, man, I worked like I worked at a wine store. I went I was going back to school. I was consulting like I was doing whatever I had to do to put food on the table and getting it done, getting it done. Right. Mm-hmm. So a lot of relationships sacrificed because that because there was just I didn't have any time. My one thing was I got to provide. But it, through that process, you kind of shed the old skin and something new arises. And so hardship is part of this game. It just is. And you learn along the way. And so it's, it's usually short term. So there will be another side. You just have to continue to kind of plow through it. So at 28, I think I was a little too full of myself in the sense of I got this on lock, right? I got, this is, this is, I see where my path is going. No. <laughs> <laughs> the universe goes, oh, yeah? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then I wake up with a black eye going, what the hell just happened? That was real for me. That was a real gut check into, all right, 
Mm-hmm. You ready for the big leagues? Mm. Let's, let's see how you roll out. And again, I can't thank my, my wife enough for standing by me. There was a lot, a lot, a lot of nights and mm. days where we just did not fill the cup because mm-hmm. there was no time. Mm-hmm. And my family as well, everyone was just a great support because I was just not there. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I was literally in a zone mm. and, until you know things started to shift uh, with that. So at 28, I'd be like, yo, <laughs> Let's uh, take a step back and you're never, quote unquote, you know, safe. Mm -hmm. You know, you always have to be thinking. Mm -hmm. Don't go into cruise control ever because I think that's such a waste of space with your mind and your passions. When you get comfortable, man, that's that's a dangerous place to be. You get comfortable I mean? with being uncomfortable. With, get comfortable being yeah. comfortable, yeah. But I want to dive in. This is it's a nice little nugget. So sure. the theme of this whole mission is mental health, mindset, emotional intelligence, all these core things in the operating system that make us human. And, you know, we're focused on entrepreneurship. So for you, when you got smacked in the face, you talked about your support system. Yeah. So all love and respect to that, but that to me is high level. Again, our sure. listeners want to know. So when you got that, whether it's the phone call or that bad month or whatever, was there victimized? Why me? Like my life's falling oh. apart. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. You know, initial reaction and how you climbed through that. Sure. There was every angle of emotions that you can imagine: anger, frustration, sadness, fear. Again, it's one thing when it's just you, but when it impacts uh, a baby who had nothing to do with anything, and a spouse who's got all her faith in you and all that, that's heavy. That's very, very heavy at 28 to process, especially when it was one of the worst recessions, I think, that we've had for a a long time across Mm -hmm. multiple generations. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, yeah, I mean, it, it was all of that. And it really took, I think, the digging out part, was, again, I can't say enough. I mean, my, my wife was very instrumental in, in just having my back mm-hmm. and just saying, hey, you know, it's going to be all right. And we're both, you know, we're people of faith. So I leaned on that a ton. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, th- th- that it just, it's a very dark place. Mm-hmm. It's a dark, dark place. And so, mind you, that was the same, at the same time, I mean, I had a co-founder. We were still trying to pour into the company we were building. And there were a lot of, that was a huge support system because it's, again, with Elliot, the ability to just kind of share in that process. And I had a couple friends that were experiencing that. We're not designed to be lone wolves, especially the mentality of, of, of a lot of guys and gals that are independent. You feel like you have to do it by yourself and you don't. As a matter of fact, a lot of the folks that I feel have tried that, the consequences are devastating. But it, seriously, it's so important to have accountability with every aspect, not just in business, but, but personally. And it's okay. We're not designed to, to walk the, the line solo. So that was huge in kind of keeping me in check, just knowing like, hey, the people that I care a lot about still have faith in, in who I am. So that helped kind of push the needle a little bit, but for your audience, I mean, I think it's important to find that person, you know, whether it's a mentor, whether it's a family member, a friend, just someone that you can kind of just spill to. Have a bad day with yeah. no judgment. No, no judgment, yeah. you know, just and that they're just going to listen. The art of listening is therapy. That is huge. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would highly encourage that. Awesome. Yeah. I think we, we hit something there. That was good. <laughs> In parting, if you could say one more thing, what would it be? I guess the, 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 the main takeaway from all this babble would be to pick one thing. Pick one thing in every layer for yourself and start with, you know, your professional layer and parry that with your personal layer. Pick one thing that you want to focus on and don't move on until you knock that out. Mm-hmm. It's hard to do. Mm-hmm. It's very, very hard to do. It may take a week. It may take a day. Five Make years. Month, five years, whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. But define your output and do that one thing at a time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that that kind of would help build focus, build clarity. And it's all about 
progress and get, getting yourself from A to B, you know, mm-hmm. and, and building people up along the way. Mm-hmm. So I'd say pick the one thing and surround yourself with just positive people. Mm-hmm. You know, you want people to, you have the choice mm-hmm. uh, in many cases to dictate who you huddle with. Mm-hmm. Make sure those people are, are filling you up, man. Mm-hmm. You know, there's plenty in the world to take away. Get your cup filled mm-hmm. by those that uh, show you nothing but love, encouragement. It's okay to get kind of put in check from now and then. I'm not saying that, but you want to surround yourself with really positive influence because it's a journey and you're going to fall. You want that accountability to help pick you up when, when that time comes. So, mm-hmm. But yeah, pick, pick one thing and define your output and those one thing steps will help you get there, I think is probably the, the biggest takeaway. And one more thing that was the what and the how, what's your why? So my why is unequivocally all back down to current in my current where I can see, right? Because mm-hmm. we talked about ah, it earlier, it. right? I so, love so, it. Yep. so where I'm standing today, mm-hmm. it is squarely on my family, mm-hmm. right? It mm-hmm. is it's I'm again I'm in a I'm in a sand one of those timers that's just the sands are you know the pieces of sand are just they're falling every second. So I only have a limited time to pour as much experience and connection at the ages where they're at now. And so everything I do, I'm really trying to create opportunities to, to just do that. And so my why is, is still time and having enough of it to, to pour back into them. Mm-hmm. That's my main why. Love it. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, brother. All right, man. You bet. It's fun. It's awesome.